Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our third installment of Advent is Coming, our exploration of the opening collect of each of the Sundays of Advent, as well as the scripture readings for years A, B, and C for Advent, the four weeks of Advent. So the first week of Advent, we spent time recognizing that the church places a focus on the second coming of Christ at the beginning of Advent. That we are in the midst of a new Advent as we anticipate the arrival of the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of time. So we come to understand and recognize that Advent isn't just about preparation for the celebration of the Incarnation that's a lot of, uh, what's the opposite of alliteration when it's at the end of the word, right? The anticipation, the uh, preparation of the anticipation of the celebration of the incarnation, right? A rhyme, I guess. Just rhyme, yeah, exactly. So that's the first week, the first Sunday of Advent. Last Sunday, we were introduced to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is such a central figure to the coming, heralding the coming of Jesus Christ, that the church gives John the Baptist recognition on two of the four Sundays of Advent. And so we will talk a little more today about John the Baptist and his role. So let us begin by way of prayer. Let us recite together Collect 3. Advent 3, the opening collect. This is the thing that I pray at the beginning of the service. I pray this not for myself, but on behalf of all of you. And so, um, so I'd like you to pray it with me. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. What, what phrases, what words sort of spring to life in your heart as you see that? What struck you? Anybody? Bountiful grace. Bountiful grace, Molly, thank you. It, isn't bountiful grace a beautiful phrase? And we've just celebrated Thanksgiving in our secular society, and we talk about the bounty, right? God always gives us more than we could ever need, desire, or hope for, and so God's grace is bountiful and abundant. Charlie. Come among us. Come among us. What strikes you about that phrase? Be here with us. I love the fact that we know Jesus is coming, but that we are requesting that he come in that phrase, right? It's not just, oh gosh, everybody everybody better get in church because he's coming. I told folks this last week that I, uh, <laughs> when Jesus comes for the second and final time, I do hope he catches me in church. <laughs> if he catches me during an LSU football game, I might not be <laughs> saying the kindest, love it, most loving things. But come among us is a request, isn't it? Yes, John. Sorely hindered by our sins. Sorely hindered by our sins. So the last two Sundays, we've been focused on preparation of our souls and spirits by acknowledging that we are a sinful, wounded, and broken people, and that we need Jesus' redemption. So come among us so that we can be redeemed. The thing that stuck out for me as we just read it just now, it, hadn't, it didn't strike me prior to this, just in this moment, speedily help and deliver us. Because in the second reading, we're in year A right now, in the second reading, the epistle reading of year A is the letter of James, and you'll see that at, at services if you come to the 1030. And the letter of James, and even though I don't preach about it today, the letter of James is all about be patient. Be patient, be patient, and waiting for the Lord. And here we are saying, hurry up! Hurry up and help and deliver us! And that speedily help and deliver us gives us a sense of eager anticipation, right? That yes, we must be patient, but that we must ask and invite Christ to come again. 
So this is part of some of my research on this opening collect. And this is what it has to say. And you'll notice that I have three different footnotes because there are three different things that if you look at it, you go, whoa, whoa, what is he talking about? The Galatian Sacramentary is the source for this collect, which is included in the first of the propers for Advent and is addressed to the Son. So in the prayer, we're actually addressing Jesus. The Galatian, Gallican Bobio Missal, that sounds fake, but it's not, provides it as a second prayer in the first of three Masses for Advent. In the Sarum Missal, it was appointed for the fourth Sunday of Advent. So you have three sources out of which this collect flows. And what are those three sources? What do they look like? So the Galatian Sacramentary. It's a book of liturgical rites that dated between 628 and 715 AD, most likely composed by Roman priests, which was then imported into France and conformed to local traditions and practices. It's also from uh, the Galatian Sacramentary. It was also influential in the first collect uh, of Advent as well, on the first week of Advent. The Gallican Bobio Missal is a 7th century liturgical book of probable French origin that was found in the Bobbio Abbey in Italy by a Benedictine monk in 1686. So think about the fact that it was hidden for a thousand years. Because the 7th century is the 600s, and it was found in, the 16, in 1686. That's a thousand years. That's quite a time. The Missal is the earliest liturgical manuscript surviving from the medieval period. And then finally, our collect for today finds its, uh, some origins in the Sarum Missal. In essence, the Sarum Rite was a local medieval modification of the Roman Rite in use at the Cathedral Church of Salisbury in England. In the later Middle Ages, it became increasingly influential throughout England, Wales, and Ireland. Indeed, in 1543, the use of the Sarum Breviary was imposed on the whole of the southern province in England, and it was from the books of the Sarum Rite that the architects of the first prayer book of Edward VI took most of their material. What does it tell you that the opening collect for today's service comes from three antique um, historical, traditional, liturgical books? What does it tell you that we get our sources from three different places? It should tell us that it's of great significance, that it's an important prayer, and that that should say, speak volumes to us. Further study also shows us that Cranmer retained the collect in that version of the Sarum Rite with slight changes, adding the phrase, come among us, and at the end of the petition, through the satisfaction of thy son, our Lord. Now, revisers, remember the prayer book has been revised several times. We are on the cusp of yet another prayer book revision in the coming, uh, in the coming future of the Episcopal Church. Revisers in 662 added the phrase, in running the race that is set before us. Now, obviously, it must be taken out because it's not in the current collect. <clears throat> but in running the race that is set before us and expanded deliver us to help and deliver us. Cranmer's second phrase was deleted in the 1928 revision, and the first of the editions of the 1662 edition has been dropped in the present revision, thus restoring the prayer to a form that is closer to its original. The prayer, Collect, 3 of, a collect of Advent 3, echoes Psalm 80, verse 2, and Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Psalm 80 says, in the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up, stir up your strength, and come to help us. And we said come to help and deliver us, right? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us, and persevere in running the race that lies before us. One of the things that I really hope you take away from some of these sessions that we do together is the fact that our prayer book was not just formed by a bunch of men, it was compiled by men, but so much of the prayer book comes straight from scripture. A word, a phrase, a turn of phrase, an idea, a thought. Scripture is littered throughout the Book of Common Prayer. We 
who might struggle a little bit, and I'm putting, I'm saying the universe, I'm not just saying the universal we, I'm saying me, who might struggle with uh, every word of scripture and every word of the Book of Common Prayer and you know what, what is scriptural, what is not, that kind of thing. I want you to know that our Book of Common Prayer is just chock full of scripture. The language is beautiful. The one remnant of a series of four prayers, we're talking about the collect again, but it's the one remnant of a series of four prayers which began with excita, stir up, used on four of the last five Sundays before Christmas and the Sarah Missal. The prayer sets forth better than the others the themes of the two Advents, the first in which he came in humility and the second in which he comes in power. The first in which he came to save and the second in which he comes to help and relieve, comes to help and deliver, right? Think about this. I love this phrase, um, this, uh, this whole notion of the two Advents, the first in which he came in humility, right? He was born, he was born a baby in Bethlehem, and we know Bethlehem means, who was here with me the last two weeks? What is the, what is the town, Bethlehem, what does Bethlehem mean? House of bread. Say that with me. House of bread. I want you to own that information. I want you to embed it in your hearts, minds, and souls and never forget it for as long as you live. Because if we understand, if we understand that Bethlehem means house of bread, then we come to understand how it is or why it is that Jesus was born there. Because in John chapter 6, when he speaks of being the bread of life, well, of course he is. Where was he born? House of, house of bread. Right? I don't know about you guys, but uh, from our house, we can smell the bakery. <laughs> it's pretty powerful. It is. It does. It smells so good. But think about the fact that he came in humility. He's a baby. He's vulnerable. What does he need? What do babies need? What do they need? Food? Shelter? Clothing, right? Love. love. Yeah, they need love. Jesus came and had to receive first. What if Mary had Jesus, instead of placing him in the manger, just put him out in the woods and said, let the wolves take care of him? Well, I don't know. I don't want to read that story. That's a little, that's a little uh, freaky. But that's how humble our God is that he came in that form. But when he comes again, is he going to come in humility again? No. No, he's going to come in power and might. And that's why we must be awake and alert and pay attention to that second coming. We mustn't necessarily be afraid. Uh, and actually, I'll address that in just that, that phrase, that notion of being afraid in, in just a moment. So the third Sunday of Advent is also known as Gaudete Sunday. The traditional Roman Missal's opening acclamation began with the word Gaudete, which means rejoice. rejoice. We take a break from the penitential nature of Advent, which is symbolized by the purple candles and vestments. And we use, well, you know, guys, we like to say, oh, it's not pink, it's rose, or it's salmon colored. It's pink. <laughs> pink candles and vestments as a sign. Now, we don't have pink vestments here. And if we did, they would be rose uh, or sad. <laughs> Candles and vestments as a sign of rejoicing over who is coming. The coming of Christ 2,000 years ago and in the future should lead us not only to repentance, but also into joy. Wow! Christ is coming again. He came in humility. Now he's coming in power and might. And he's going to set everything right. That was like a little poem. My dad would say, I was a poet and didn't know it, but my feet show it because they're Longfellows. <laughs> That's a Tiger Resale special right there, right? And where do we get that opening acclamation from that begins Gaudete or Rejoice? We get it from Philippians chapter 4. Let's read this together. You don't have to say the word Gaudete, but you can if you want to. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice! Let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything, 
but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let's sit with this for a little while. What are some phrases, some words that you saw in this passage that you that struck your heart chords? Have no anxiety about anything. Have no anxiety about anything. Does anybody here ever have anxiety about anything? <laughs> Me. And what do we say if we put our faith in the coming of Jesus Christ at the end of time? We have to have no. We should. We should have no anxiety about anything. Anybody else? What, what else struck you? Peace of God. The peace of God. What strikes you about that, Kathy? The peace of God. Because of my anxiety outside of this place. Yeah. I need that peace of God in this place. Amen. Because of because Kathy said because of the anxiety outside of this place, she needs the peace of God in this place. Amen. Anybody else? Anything else? I love which passes all understanding. I love that too. The peace which passes all understanding. And that's part of a blessing that bishops give and, and sometimes priests as well. I mean, it's a peace that is so pure, that is so holy, that is so good. Ah, you can't understand it. That doesn't mean we don't try to understand it. That doesn't mean we don't try to embrace it. But it's beyond our own understanding. That's how deep it is. Like we can sort of maybe picture or visualize well you know peace maybe it'd be sitting on the edge of smith mountain lake there's some peace and uh, maybe hiking somewhere we might find some peace um I, I even though i'm terrified when i do it sometimes if I'm, I'm downhill skiing i really i can really find myself sort of in a zen place with that activity and i can find a moment of peace it's like i've forgotten everything else around me right I mean, I'm seeing the kid that's about 20 yards ahead of me, and I'm terrified for a moment, and I'm yelling at him, I'm sorry, as I cross the back of his skis. But other than that, I've forgotten everything else. I mean, that's, I understand that peace. Imagine the peace for yourself that surpasses all understanding. Um, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That was the phrase that stood out for me just now. Let your requests be known to God. When we pray to God, are we usually asking God to keep things as they are? So often we're asking God to make them better, to improve them. We are in hardship. We are suffering under some, we're suffering somehow. And so we go to God by prayer and supplication, and we thank God for our existence, for our sustenance, for being sustained. So we give God thanks, but we also make our requests known to God. I had someone recently ask me, you know, what happens when God answers your request and it's more than you could have ever hoped or imagined? I say, praise God. Thank you, God. That's the kind of God that we have. When Jesus comes again, Jesus will set things right. There will be no Democrats and Republicans. There will be no LSU or University of Alabama. There will be no Virginia Tech, Virginia rivalries, right? There will be peace of all sorts. No separation of denominations, no separation of nationalities, no separation whatsoever. We will be one body of Christ. And that's what we're striving for here as Christians, is to be that one singular body of Christ rooted in love. Be oh, I'm sorry, Misty. Um, sure, go ahead. F fire away. I just wonder about that. Thanksgiving, I guess. Let your request be made known to God. I thought God knew everything. God does know everything. So, thank you. That's a good question. God knows everything. Do you know everything? No, and neither do I. But what happens when we go to God and we state our need? We are, we are keenly aware of it at that point. And we acknowledge, I'm not God, I can't fix this. And it requires of us a great deal of humility. The best thing to do 
uh, for those who are parents especially, is to think about your relationship with your child. You know your child might need something, but you don't just give it to them right away. You kind of wait and see, have they learned? Have they grown? Have they matured? And that child then comes to you and says, Mama, I really, really hate to ask this, but I need this. I need something. I need you. That's a lot different than just saying, yeah, yeah, go, uh, here's, here's whatever you need. You didn't even ask for it, but just take it and get out of my hair, right? Sometimes we parents do that because we're not God. We're not perfect. But when a child comes to us and they need something or want something that is good for them, you know, if a little kid comes up and says, hey, can we go play football out on Rivermont Avenue at noon in front of the post office where everybody runs that red light, I'm going to say no. Oh, but I really, really want to. No. Because you sent, so this is the proper preface of Advent. Um, this is the one that we just that we just read. And we may without shame or fear. Oh, the proper preface. I'm so silly. This is what I wanted to share with you. So the proper preface is uh, comes just before the Eucharistic prayer, just before the Holy, Holy, Holy. So I don't have to get into the, to, to the details of it, but you've got an introductory paragraph that's always there and a conclusion paragraph that's always there. And sandwiched between them is what we call the proper preface. And you do one for Lent, a special one for Lent. You do one for baptisms. You do one for marriages. Um, during the green season, when we wear the green vestments, the ordinary time, uh, we have three priests have three choices. They can use to the Father, to the Son, or to the Holy Spirit. And it sort of speaks to those uh, triune realities. In Advent, this is what the proper preface says. Because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death, and to make us heirs in Him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice, gaudete, to behold his appearing. Remember, we talked about the fact that he once came in humility, the next time he comes will be in triumph and power to judge the world. That can be daunting for some of us. And so we start to get scrupulous and worry about, oh my gosh, uh, is my soul pure? Is my soul clean? No, no, we need not be scrupulous. We must depend upon God's mercy and love. And if we can, without shame or fear, accept the coming of Christ, then we should rejoice at His appearing. That's what this third Sunday of Advent is about. It's about the rejoicing of Christ's coming at the end of time. So now that's about the opening collect. That's a lot, right? And so we're now going to get into the scripture passages. If you weren't with us for the last two Sundays, I'll just recap briefly. In the, in the church, we have what's called a lectionary. That gives us the scripture passages for each Sunday. And we, we use a common lectionary that is shared. Uh, Episcopalians share it with um, uh, Methodists and Lutherans and Congregationalists and Roman Catholics and some other denominations as well. So that... Even though we might be divided in terms of the way we are structured, we are united by hearing the same word on Sunday. So that when I talk to my mom on Sunday afternoons, she, we like to compare notes on what her priest preached about, and I get to tell her what I preached about, and, um, and it's because it's all based on the same lectionary. Also, you have years A, B, and C. Year A focuses on the Gospel of Matthew. This is the year that we're starting now in Advent. Year B, Mark, your C, Luke. We just finished Luke uh, with the Feast of Christ the King the Sunday prior to Advent. All right, let's go ahead and read this uh, scripture passage together. And we are taking this from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. Let's read this together. Now, when John heard in prison about, about the deeds, the deeds of, the Christ, of Christ, he sent word, word by his disciples and said to him, are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus, Jesus answered him, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is he who takes no offense at me. As they went away, 
Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to behold? A reed shaken by the wind? Why then did you go out? To see a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, those who wear soft raiment are in kings' houses. Why then did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So why was John the Baptist in prison? Somebody want to tell me? He criticized the king. King Herod, that's right. Because so, of his wife. That's right. Who was King Herod's wife? It was somebody who was married before. It was actually his brother's wife, yeah. right? And so he criticized that. But King Herod had a lot of respect for John the Baptist, but still had him arrested and thrown into prison. So that's why John was there. So why does John ask his disciples to go and find out if Jesus is the Messiah? I mean, John, would, would he leaped in his mother's womb when Mary meets Elizabeth. Elizabeth, who had been barren, is now pregnant, six months ahead of Mary. She greets Elizabeth, and when she greets Elizabeth, John the Baptist, inside Elizabeth's womb, leaps with joy. And didn't John say, at the time of the baptisms, Behold the Lamb of God who takes, the way to, who takes away the sin of the world as he's pointing to Jesus. So why does John ask his disciples to go and find out if Jesus is the Messiah? It goes a little bit tangentially to Misty's question. It's not because John didn't know who Jesus was. It was because John wanted his disciples to know who Jesus was. Sort of a um, a way of teaching, right? I mean, just in the same way that, yes, God knows what we need before we even ask, in our asking, we learn something about God and about ourselves. So, so did he have like a premonition that he wasn't going to survive this? Well, I can't speak to that. I don't know. But if we stay with the text, well, if we stay with the text, what we do know is that John sent his disciples to follow Jesus. Right. Why does Jesus give a cryptic answer to their question about his identity? What does Jesus tell them? Go and tell them what you hear and what you see. And then what does Jesus rattle off? All, all the things he's done. Yes, such as. Give, just, right, let's, let's put them together, right? Healing lepers. Healing lepers is one. Uh, making the blind see. What's that? Making the blind see. The, deaf walk. the lame walk. The deaf hear. Water and wine. No, not the water and the wine. He didn't. He doesn't list. Yeah. He doesn't list that. But what was the? Dead lepers are healed. Yes, we said that the lepers are healed. The dead shall be raised, and the poor shall have the good news preached to them. So, why does Jesus give them this cryptic answer? Where do we see a similar list in Isaiah chapter thirty-five, which is today's first reading from the Old Testament? Jesus, and so Isaiah chapter 35 is saying, you will know when the Messiah is here because the deaf will hear, the blind will see, um, the lepers will, no, he doesn't say the lepers. He says the, um, uh, the lame shall walk and the mute shall speak. Jesus is pointing back to that prophecy. If Isaiah is saying, these are the things, these are the criteria that you'll, you'll need to know for when the Messiah comes, and Jesus says, here I am. Go tell them what you see. It's all the stuff in Isaiah chapter 35. What does that tell the disciples? That it's him. It's Jesus. It's the Messiah. So those theologians who try to argue that Jesus was not aware of his own self-identity, I'm not sure that I can accept that when I take a look at this. Why does Jesus say what he does? Oh, I already asked that. About, because he is, he is pointing back to Isaiah chapter 35. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 35. This is today's Old Testament reading. Let's read this together. The wilderness and the dry land 
shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice. Look at that. The desert shall rejoice, right? We're Gaudete Sunday, which means rejoice. Imagine a desert barren, right? Now, plants and animals and things, they all adapt to that environment. However, we know that the desert is longing for water. The desert needs water to survive. All right, so when the Messiah comes, the desert shall rejoice and blossom. Imagine how verdant and how beautiful that will be. Like, pick it back up, like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing for joy. The ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Isaiah is giving us a prophecy, and he's not giving us doom and gloom, is he? Isaiah is telling us there will be a time of great joy and a time of great rejoicing when that Messiah comes. When we look at this prophecy from Isaiah 35, it's not just about pointing forward to the Christ child, the anointed one. This is actually Isaiah's prophecy about the end of time, about the coming of God. It's not you will know who the Christ, the anointed one is because of the things that are listed the blind, the deaf, the lame, and the dumb. That's not just when the anointed one shows up, it's when God shows up. That is a huge claim. So when Jesus is pointing back to Isaiah 35, and he says, go read Isaiah 35, and, and then come back and tell me who I am. Jesus is clearly saying, I'm not just the anointed one. I am God. Wow. Wow. Mind blown, as the kids say. Right? Isaiah is speaking about the... See, I get so excited, I get ahead of myself. Isaiah is speaking about the age of salvation when God will come. This is more than a Savior, an anointed one, a Messiah, a King. This is God come down that is being prophesied. God is going to be here. Isaiah also gives a checklist so that we will know when God has come. What does Jesus do with that checklist? He checks it off. And he fulfills it. There was a question, I think, two Sundays ago that someone asked about, will we recognize Jesus when he comes again? Yes, we will. Because there will be no more blindness, no more deafness, no more hardness of heart. We will all be one in that unity of love as God is in unity with God's own self in the Holy Trinity. So let's skip ahead to year C, the year of Luke. So you would have heard this last Advent, year, uh, week three. What should we do to prepare for his coming? Let's read this together. And the multitudes asked him, What then shall we do? And John the Baptist answered them, He who has two coats, let him share with him who has none. And he who has food, let him share with him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than is appointed to you. Soldiers asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Rob no one by violence or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. He preached good news. What is the word? Evangelium, good news, means in English, gospel. He preached the gospel to them. Here, 
John the Baptist is being very clear about what we're supposed to do. As we await the coming of the Messiah, the Christos, as we await the return of God, this broken, wounded, sinful world that's in our hands, that we're living in the midst of, we are called to do justice, to act rightly, to feed the poor, to help those who are downtrodden, we're to raise up the hopeless. All these things that God will do in a permanent way, we are called to do in the course of our own lives. So Advent isn't just about lighting the pretty Advent wreath. It's not just about putting up the Christmas tree and putting out the manger scene. It's not just about making really good eggnog. But it really is about doing other things. Preparing doesn't mean sitting back and waiting and saying, okay, here I am. Come, God. We do say that in our prayer, but it's about doing things. Last week, we had folks who were here who put 40,000 pounds. Do you imagine how much that is? 40,000 pounds of potatoes went in individual bags and then given to those who are in need. You're doing it, my friends. You are doing it. Praise God. Aren't you excited? Better luck with the Baptist group. <laughs> right? Yes. yes, you're doing it. There's a giving tree that's out in Fauber Gallery that I hope you'll stop by. We have uh, received an abundance of requests to help uh, children whose parents are incarcerated. That's the Angel Tree program with the Yoder Center. And we also are working with Bear Mountain, our friends, our Native American friends, the Monicans. Um, there are children there whose families cannot afford Christmas gifts for the children. And so we have the opportunity to bring some happiness to these young people in our midst. And so I do hope you'll stop by the Giving Tree and pick one up on the way. If only I knew. I think Kenzie told me Wednesday. Wednesday the 18th. What's the, uh, the 18th is Wednesday. Yes, Wednesday. Thanks, Bill. That's a good question. So the instruction here, what is the instruction? I answered my own question. How does, this, how does this instruction of doing things differ from how we approach the season of Lent? So in Lent, what do we commonly, we Christians, what do we commonly do in Lent? Give we give something up. Yeah. Yeah, we usually give something up. We make a sacrifice, right? Here, and in Lent, actually, we are really invited to do more than sacrifice. We are actually invited and encouraged to do something to set the world aright. With God's help, of course. It is not upon us. We are weak, we are lowly, and we can only do what we can do with God's overabundant grace. So how might this approach of giving to those who are poor and in need, how might this approach to Advent be an antidote to the cultural materialism that the Christmas season brings? Does it serve as an antidote? We change the focus of not getting, but giving. Amen. Molly Jenkins, ding, ding, ding. You get a gold star today. It's not just about getting, it's about giving. And look, I know that all of us here are generous with our family and our friends. I know that you go to Christmas parties and you bring a bottle of wine. I know that really well. Thank you, by the way. I know that you provide for your family, your friends, and your children. I know that. This is giving at a different level. This is more universal giving. This is, this is something that, that really grabs our hearts and molds and changes us while the world is being changed. So in seminary, um, I, I don't know if you know, I was in seminary for six years, not because I'm slow, but because <laughs> that's... What? Excuse me, Betsy. <laughs> for the first time, she laughed louder than you did, Alice. <laughs> It's not because I'm slow, but because in the Catholic tradition, um, you do two years of philosophy and four years of theology. So I was in seminary for six years, and in those six years was privileged to go to Nicaragua uh, four or five times and to Mexico once to do mission work. And we always went just before Advent break, just before the Christmas break. So the beginning, the first couple of weeks of December, we would go. And the abject poverty that we were in the midst of was so overwhelming. And I will tell you 
that you go down there, you're serving the poor, we're building houses, we're doing all kinds of things, feeding kids. There was an orphanage down there that we worked with. And it was so spiritually fulfilling. And then we, we came back here, and I was prepared for it after my first experience. But my very first experience, I was sick, nauseous, because I saw the materialism that our culture is wrapped up in. I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. I, I, I was confused. Now, I, you know, I, I, it was a powerful, powerful experience. And so as we look at our ever-growing shopping lists and the things we got to do and the things we need to bake and make and, and get for this one and get for that one, let us not just walk by those who are in need. Many of you here have been ringing bells for Salvation Army, and you have seen the generosity of the community put their funds in the bucket. And it's great. I do hope, though, your experience transcends the bucket and that you get to see and experience and understand what poverty does to the human spirit. And they're right outside. They're just down the street and maybe even next door to us. Advent is a time to open our eyes. Isn't it interesting we light an Advent wreath which has candles and candles throw light that allow us to see better and more clearly. He, from Proverbs chapter 19, he who has compassion on the poor lends to the Lord, and he, the Lord, will repay him for his good deed. When we show compassion to the poor, we are showing compassion to God, because God dwells within each and every human heart and soul. John the Baptist says this about Jesus, and this should be our mantra for ourselves during Advent. He, Jesus, must increase I, I must decrease. You know, we don't go around saying all the good things that we're doing during Advent. We don't tell everybody how we have done such wonderful things. Now, yes, we posted on Facebook things that we've done as a community. I'm talking about as individuals. If you come in here and you take this microphone and you say, well, I just have to tell you everything that I've done during Advent. It's been wonderful. And I just feel so good. That's not what this season is about. Jesus must increase. And Jesus came to us first how? Humility. humility. In humility. And so we must decrease so that he may increase because when he comes again, he will come in glory and majesty and power. Yes, thank you. And power. We are not the powerful ones, right? So let's send that message up to Washington, D.C. <laughs> Doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. I'm not making a commentary about anybody. It's okay. We're all good. How are we called to use the season of Advent to decrease ourselves so that Christ might increase? And it's basically serving others. All right. Well, here ends the lesson. I did get through it a little faster than I thought. But we're doing good. Questions. Thoughts. What, what struck you? And look. I know, I'm asking a question and I'm telling you to hold your, hold your questions. I know that I get really, really excited. And I know it sounds like I'm shouting and I'm, you know, just going cuckoo. Um, and here's the truth. Uh, actually, I am shouting and going cuckoo. <laughs> it's true. Because I believe in my heart that God exists and God is real, but that God is not some distant being sitting on some throne that is on some planet in some solar system, but God is here right now in our midst and God invites us and challenges us and loves us to do service. So yeah, I get a little bit excited. Um, and so I hope you'll pardon my enthusiasm and recognize what it, what it is because I love you. I love you so much. I want you to know what I feel I know. I want you to, to believe what I believe to be true. Because I know that God is coming again in glory and majesty. And all of this stuff will be set right. Because my brothers and sisters in Christ, this cannot be it. What kind of sadistic, sick God would set us into motion and allow us to remain broken, wounded, and sinful for all eternity. 
That is not the God that I subscribe to or believe in because it is not the God that exists. I was just, I, I was doing some reflection the other day and I recall reading and I, I said it to Nicole at the office and I said, you know, I'm so, I can remember things that I read sometimes, but I can't remember who said this. And that drives me crazy. But I remember reading not long ago, within the last two to three years, you know, we hear that faith, hope, and love of the three, what's the greatest? Love. love. Why? Because it encompasses the other two. It, it'd be more than it encompasses the other two. Because when Jesus comes again and we are filled and we are in the kingdom, do we have faith anymore? No. The proof is right there in front of us. We see God. We don't need to have faith. Is there hope anymore? No, because we don't have to hope. Because if we have hope, then there's some level of hopelessness. And all of our hopelessnesses will be gone. So faith will subside. Hope will subside. And punching through it into the universe is love. Love of the three is the only one that is eternal. Faith, hope, and love. And of these three, the greatest is love. All right. Sorry. Whew. You get me worked up. Y'all didn't do anything, but just sit there and give me a microphone. Shame on you. Yes, Stevie. Why do we stop talking about John the Baptist? Well, if you come next week, you will hear what the church is doing in choosing the readings for the fourth Sunday of Advent. Um, I mean, he's got 50% of Advent. You want to give John the Baptist some more? <laughs> you know, he got beheaded, so... <laughs> I mean, his, his story did get cut off at some point. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> See, God will come and set things right, and that joke will be removed. John? Uh, the, uh, the things that struck me is uh, God came in humility... If you come in power, yeah, and that we are called to decrease those things. That that helps, doesn't it? It sort of kind of takes a pin and sticks it on our little ego, doesn't it? And goes, whoo, okay. Thank you for that, Kathy. This is just a comment that I that came into my head when you were describing faith, hope, and love. Mm -hmm. Faith and hope are individual things for yourself. Mm -hmm. Love is what you give. Oh. And this is the season of... Love, love is rooted in relationship. Right? Yes. Other thoughts, reflections. I love this. This is good. Anybody else? Did you learn anything today? Yes. Some things? A few things? Yes, Max. We've been talking about the new Christ coming. Yes. Well, the same Christ. It's not a new Christ. It's the same Christ. And my, I look around people that I know here. Our grandmothers listened to this and they died. Yes. And Christ didn't come again. Yep. My mother, our mothers died. Christ didn't come again. Yep. And I'm not sure about what's going to happen to me or you. But you, you talked about what it was going to be like when the new Christ comes. The, that's the new Christ. There's no new Christ. It's the Christ. When the Christ comes again. You, you, you told us how it would be. Why can't we do a better job today for those of us who are living? Because we may be dead when Christ comes again. Why can't we do a better job so we make it like Christ is going to make it when Christ comes? Why do we have to wait? Because we are, we are sinful human beings. Because only Jesus will eradicate sin from our existence. So what you're proposing is a human solution. And what we are looking for is a divine solution. It's why Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Yes, our ancestors have died and Jesus hasn't returned yet. They're sleeping and they're awaiting the second coming of Christ. It's why we say in the Nicene Creed, Christ will come to judge who? The living, the living and the dead. The living and the dead. And so 
Jesus is the only one. God is the only one who has that power. Does that mean that we give up on trying to make things right? No, that's the way of love. That's what, that's what my sermon is actually about today. And it's, um, yes, we are called as Christians, Max, to set these things aright. But we don't have the power to do it on our own. God has to be infused in it. Does that answer your question? It, that's, a, that's a good answer. It doesn't answer the problem. <laughs> the problem is, why can't we do better what the Christ that we know wants us to do? Why can't you? I try. And so do I. And so do all these people. A lot of people are not trying. Well, that, that's exactly right. Now you've been on... The, and what is wrong with those people? Let's just name it, right? What's wrong with those people who are not trying? They're sinful. Sinful. Self-centered. Self-centered, right? Power hungry. Egotistical. Yes, there are a lot of people, and they will have to make their peace with God when Christ comes again. We as Christians, that's why, that's why we can rejoice at the second coming of Christ rather than being fearful. When Christ comes and Christ makes himself known, there's going to be those who are going to be really disappointed and those who are going to be very excited. And so the way in which we live, the way in which we love, the way in which we treat one another, the way in which we do God's own works with God's own grace, um, that, that's, all, that's all blessing. There is fruit being born in our communities. I mean, Max, you have a great relationship with our Monacan brothers and sisters who have been ostracized and isolated in so many ways. And now we're building these bridges of relationship. The Yoder Center. You know, we go into the Yoder Center and there's, there's, there's racism. Is racism ended on earth? Of course not. But in that moment, in that pocket, there is love. And that's where we see the fruit being born. It's a good question, Max. It's hard. This is, this is like really philosophical, theological, high-minded stuff you're, you're getting at. And I love it. So don't stop asking those questions. I just hope that I can answer it. But even then, I'm imperfect and I'm dumb. It took me six years to get out of seminary. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs>